Show your love for right trend. Amen, amen, amen. We bless God, we bless God. Oh my goodness. Is not a blessing? Oh, come on somebody. That is so amazing. Please have your seats. I tell you there's blessing in this house. God is doing amazing, amazing things. I see movements arising in this place. Yeah, I see movements arising. Look at your neighbor by the way because you're seeing a movement leader there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell your neighbor, don't just see me the way you're seeing me right now. <laughs> Yeah, God is doing something powerful in this house. He's raising up armies. He's raising up soldiers. People who are going to change the world for his glory. Amen. You know this thing about following. When God began to teach me, it was very new for me. Because when I was disciple as a Christian, I wasn't taught these things. I I knew something about it, but nobody told me this is what we do. Sometimes I found myself following without knowing what I was doing. Because nobody told me this is what you're doing. You're actually following. I followed without knowing what I was doing. At some point, I began to ask God, "Who can I learn from? Who are the people who can teach me?" And it's interesting. I've told you that I started to learn from uh, Bishop Dag, and I started connecting with Apostle Mukisa in uh, in Kampala and other people like those. And God has been so gracious to bring people to lead me in this season. But you know, it's also I began to also ask God, which is the place we can really learn? following. I believe that all wisdom is God's wisdom. All wisdom is God's wisdom. You can learn as a Christian from anywhere. I've studied different movements. I've studied the Islamic movement because I believe that the wisdom that is there is God's wisdom. Yeah. Sometimes you can have God's wisdom without even knowing God. The Bible talks about King Cyrus, who got, who was God's chosen instrument. He was a pagan king. He was an oppressive king. He was a conqueror and a murderer. He killed many people, but God used him as his chosen instrument to bring deliverance to God's people. And so I learned from different people. At Fearless, we learned from the from the from the uh, gay movement, because that's a movement. And we studied some of the things they do. And we said, look, as Christians, the people of this world, need, uh, we need to learn from everybody. The Bible says, be as wise, uh, be as, as as wise as serpents, as innocent as doves. And so we learn. And as I began to ask God, where, what movements are there? What, where is the place we can really learn following? Who's, who's the most excellent institution at following in the world? Yeah, yeah, it's it's the army. In every country, that's where you're going to find some serious discipline. You're going to find people who understand following. And so I I I went and had a conversation with a friend, and today I want to introduce you to this friend. Uh, he's a retired major in the Kenyan Defence Forces. I'm going to ask you to give a big Mavuno welcome to Major Boke. <laughs> Amen. Do you want us to sit over here? Is that okay? Come on, let's appreciate him. Let's appreciate Major Boke. I think they want us to sit over here. Can you see us? Amma, we come forward. I think we should come forward. I think we should pull our chairs forward. Is that better? All right. Does he look like a military man? <laughs> Amen. Come on, let's appreciate Major Boke one more time. <laughs> wow. So, uh, Major Boke, it's so, so good to have you here. Uh, we're really excited. As you can see, he's the founder and CEO of Jeff Hamilton Limited which is an integrated outsourcing company focusing on manpower, security, and facility management. And he's also starting a movement because you can see their presence in Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Zambia. Come on, somebody. This is, this is how it's meant to be. We're not supposed to be local. If you're part of Mavuno, you're global. And Major Boke is a part of this congregation. He's been with us for many years. Uh, and my goodness, we've seen you grow. Uh, we've just seen you grow from church to, I mean, from, from glory to glory, from stage to stage. And today you're one of the leading um, security companies in our country, and it's, it's been quite a journey, hasn't it? Yeah, true that, true that. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, true that. Let, let's see. Is it on? Yeah, it is now. Yeah, true that. That is true. Yeah. Uh, and thank you very much for choosing to host me uh, this afternoon. Uh, to begin, Pastor Kwakuni host Leo. 
So, Pasi, thank you. Thank you very much Amen. for thank honoring you. me to choose to have this conversation it's with you. It's great to have you here. Yeah. And, you know, we've chatted quite a bit with you. One of the things that I want to just say, he's not just a, major, a retired major. He has an MBA in strategic management from the University of Nairobi. He has a B.Ed. science degree in physics and mathematics from Kenyatta University. He was actually a teacher trained. Uh, he has a certificate in military science from Egerton University. And, and he's also an alumni of the owner management program uh, from Strathmore University. Uh, was class president in his time. I mean, this discipline of the military, we can see it everywhere he goes. And he's married to Lucy. And they have four amazing sons. I mean, he has an army. You know, the Bible talks about the man with a quiver, in, a, a quiver full of arrows. He has four amazing sons who we've seen around uh, as they've been part of this congregation over the years. And now are adults. I don't believe any of them yes, is at home yes. now. The last one is 19. Come on, somebody. That's amazing. And uh, he's married to the amazing Lucy. When, uh, when the, she's an amazing person. And uh, she might be around at some point. So is Lucy here yet? If she's not, she's on her way. Oh, there she is. Oh, my goodness. She's sitting so far. Great to see you. Uh, really good to see you. She's also just as tall and stately as him. And uh, they have an amazing story of how they met. Uh, that I won't ask him to go into today. But we, we met in Akesha. <laughs> <laughs> the Pastor, question is Pastor what? Milton, Pastor Milton knows. He knows that Kesha you are in. Eh? He knows the church you are going to. <laughs> well, let's just say it was Akesha, but not the kind you're thinking. Uh, there are spirits, but you are not it's not the spirits that we know. <laughs> it's not the Holy Spirit we know. But that was before, uh, that was his before story. And God has sustained you and given you a family, and you've built an amazing company. Maybe we can just start with um, why you joined the military. You're a trained teacher. Um, you had a career in teaching. Why would you decide to join the military? Thank you, Pasi, and thank you again for, for hosting me. So um, I was born in Kuria. So it's a small community um, in, in Nyanza, in Migori County. So we are majorly very big in Tanzania, but very small in Kenya. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, I studied in Kisumu, which will be the provincial headquarters those days. Wow. Any um, people from Korea in the room? Any people we from Korea? We are very few. I might be the only one. Pastor Korea. <laughs> <laughs> no, not Pastor Korea. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so a minority, it's a small minority It's a very community. small community in Kenya. Yeah. So, so then uh, after Kisumu, I went to KU. Uh, as you said, I did the, the degree in physics and mathematics. Uh, so when I came to Nairobi, I, I, Nairobi was very good to my eye. It looked very nice. Yeah. Um, uh, then after I finished the degree, I was posted back to Korea. Ah. I, I thought that was not fair. Because you had left. I had left. I had gone to school so that I exit the village. <laughs> and then TSC took me back. Back to the village. I thought that this is not fair. Yeah. So, so I basically joined the army to run away from the village. Wow. Yeah. So you joined the army... Not because you wanted to die for your country, to serve it. No intention. Be <laughs> because you love this great country, but because you do not want to be in the village. Yes. You know, it's a very interesting question because, um, you know, many people join the army without the right motive. And I'm a pastor because my girlfriend joined internship. I had. Yeah. <laughs> but God still uses you. Tell your neighbor, it doesn't matter your motive, you're still here. Yeah, 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 yeah. You might have had the wrong motive when you joined, but here you are. Look at how far God has brought you. Uh, now, you um, basically joined the army, and you were telling us, uh, my wife and I had an amazing afternoon with these guys, and they made an amazing, your wife is an incredible cook. Thank oh, you. my goodness. Thank you. She is incredible, and a great host. They are great hosts as well. And you told us some of the stories about um, the, the boot camp. Uh, when you first go in as a fresh recruit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tell us a bit about what are some of the methods that the army uses to induct you into the army as a recruit. Oh, thank you, Pasi. So, so the, when you join the army, so the, the, uh, there, there are two types of army. So there's the cadet, which is the, the manager, and then there's the recruit, which is the soldier. So the soldier trains in Eldoret, and the, the cadet trains in Nakuru. So, so I was a cadet. Yeah. So when you join the cadet, um, um, the, the minimum qualification is B+. Plus. So you have um, anyone from B+, plus to degree. It's unlikely that you'll get a master's because the cutoff is 26 years. So, so it's unlikely that you'll get a master's wow. degree. So, so the, when you are recruited, they create the impression that you're going to be this big commander on day one. 
So, so, so when, when you leave home, you know, you know our country, so guys escort you, maybe in a Nissan with your villagers, with um, those things we put on our nets <laughs> and, and saying congratulations. So when you get to the gate, you're expecting a laptop and an office. Come on. So that is what I was expecting. <laughs> and my village told me, ukienda, tutumie pesa. Send money. Send money. <laughs> so you get to the gate, and uh, so everyone is held at the gate. Uh, so when I trained in 1997, we were 88 of us. 70 were Kenyans, and then 18 were from Botswana, Swaziland, and Malawi. Yeah. So it's an international school. Then you get to the gate, and uh, they will tell you, all the graduates, this side. So you see, you move that side, you, you imagine they'll probably give you a better a, job. A bigger office. Yeah, a bigger office. Because you know you're a graduate, and mm, these are the guys. Mm, mm, mm. So once that is done, then they would also ask you, so how many are swimmers? Um, um, and probably um, um, I was not a swimmer myself. So the first lesson is a confidence lesson. So they will take you to the swimming pool. Uh, so the swimmers will be requested to take a break, and then the non-swimmers will be requested to jump <laughs> into, into the pool. And uh, remember, you may have a sudi, na tie. You are fully dressed. You are fully dressed. But they will allow you to remove the tie. So basically, <laughs> so confidence training, as carrying any confidence. The, so, so that is one part. Then the other part I will remember is that, um, uh, so you sleep at 11 o'clock, you wake up at 4.30. Um, it will take you like 45 minutes to prepare your bed, because yeah. there's a way you prepare your bed. Just the bed? Just the bed. So there's a way you prepare it, and then there's an instructor who will come and ensure that it is properly done. Yeah. Then you do the morning runs and all those type of things. Uh, so that is just basically to build your character. I think the army is very big on, on building people's oh. characters. Wow. And on that character, one of the biggest focus is humility. So like when you go in, they take away all privileges. So the first thing they do is that there's a kinyozi, a very, um, I hope everyone understands a kinyozi. Ababa. Ababa. My friends from uh, Champala, Ababa. He's a very old guy who's been shaving guys in the school for the longest time. So it takes it all off. It takes it all off. Whether we, you're a lady, we can see it still off even yeah, now. just <laughs> leaves it completely plain. So ladies are traumatized because they come in with amazing hair. Or oh, even the women's hair. Is cut even off. The, everyone's hair. Okay. Everyone's hair is taken off, and then you are given a boot, the soldier's boot, socks, a short, a short. Um, let me say a bad short and a sweater or a jersey. So you put on the boots with socks, then shorts. Uh, then shorts, then a sweater, you tuck it in. Then because the short has no places to put a belt, you tie the belt on your tummy. Then you put on a, a, a coffee. A hat. A hat. Yeah. So that is what you'll use for the first three, for the first three months. Wow. Then so they take all away. your nice clothes are gone. Everything is gone. All your privileges are gone. Your hairstyle is gone. Everything is gone. My goodness. Well, okay. All right. Yeah, keep going. So, so, so once that is question. done, so they take away everything, all privileges. You are not supposed to think. Thinking is prohibited. Um, <laughs> <laughs> at, at a serious level, as in you are not supposed to have an opinion. So you just do what you are told. Now, now it's interesting because... <laughs> They were recruiting B plus. Yes, to be managers. They wanted the smart managers, the ones who think. Yes, but thinking is prohibited. It's prohibited. Uh, you are not supposed to think. What a shock! Then, uh, so as you as you continue with the training, uh, then now they introduce confidence training. So confidence, cowardice is highly frowned upon in the in the military, and there's a court martial offense called cowardice. Wow. So if you are a coward, that's a court martial offense. Um, so, there are several things that we did that I will remember um, that makes you confident. As part of that As training. part of that training. So, I think the ones I will remember quickly is there's what they call battle simulation. So, battle simulation, they take like a depressed place or a lager. Mostly it happens in Maasai land because Maasai land has a lot of lagers or dry rivers. Then they'll put the machine guns like on a 100 meter stretch. So the light purpose machine gun or the general purpose machine gun. So the ones that do pop, 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 pop. Um, Then they, so, so there's it, the, the machine guns are stretched across the 100 meters. Then they have um, soldiers. 
So the soldiers are shooting continuously. So the exercise is that you crawl on the lager across the 100 meters to the, to the end. With live with ammunition, live ammunition. Going above you. So the instruction is don't lift your head because the bullet is just above, above your head. So if you try to lift, you're dead. You're dead. And uh, the military is allowed 10% deaths in training. <laughs> so in training, <laughs> so, so, so if you are 88, like we were 88, if 8.8 .8 die, That's okay. there's no inquiry. There's, that is okay. There's no inquiry needed. There's no inquiry. But not like if 10 died, now there'll be an inquiry. <laughs> um. so, <laughs> I think people are still absorbing what you're saying. So, so basically the picture we get mm. is that it's not an easy training. It's not. It breaks you down. Yes. It gets you, you're a zombie because you're sleeping very few hours. Yes. You're running all the time. Yes. I remember you told us about one opinionated gentleman yes. who was very educated yes. and who was asked about how the food tasted yes. and he had an opinion. Exactly. Maybe you can just tell so that I can just I can just take you. So, so, so as I told you, you are not allowed to think. And um, when uh, the, the rule is, you've seen like in the parades, just to digress, the president sometimes stops to talk to a soldier. And the, soldier, the president will ask, so how is... Um, how is the uh, military, how is everything? There's only one answer. The answer is it is great. So, um, so, so we had, had, this guy was a student leader from Moy University. And he had just come from the university, he was a lawyer and he was very opinionated. So, so a student so leader and a lawyer. He's a lawyer and a student leader. So the, um, the, the food is not great. Okay, I'm allowed to say that now. <laughs> so so the, there's a senior officer who asked him, so um, um, how was food? And the guy was on it. Ah, the salt was not good, the cooking. So he just went on and on. And everyone was like, oh my God. We are in it for a root shock. So the punishment is, you carry your bed, the, 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 your bed in full. You, you carry it. He, he carried it? He carries oh. his bed. Okay. So you go to the hostels. But it was not just him, it was? No, no, this one was his. It was this him, this okay. was an individual punishment. Okay. So you carry your bed, then uh, you go to the parade square, then you sleep, as in you, you enter inside and you sleep. During the day. Then you must, no, you must show that you are sleeping. You must produce evidence that you are asleep. Then they bring water. They bring like the water boozer. Then the water is poured on you. Then you sleep there until you are told to wake up. So that is the punishment. And so sometimes also the, the team members also get certain punishments, what we call kusindikiza. Because, because to, because escort, to, to escort, escort him, the yeah, to escort him. Because you guys were not serious, you let one of your team members to be rogue. It's your responsibility to ensure that everyone is aligned. So the whole... The, everyone team. suffers. Wow. Yeah. Now, I think I wanted to ask you, now you've been out for a while, maybe you understand why they had to take you through this very hard training. It, some of it just seemed not to make sense. Uh, you're not supposed to think, you're not supposed to have an opinion. Why would they teach you that? Because they want educated, sharp generals, majors, who can stand their, their, their weight anywhere in the world. So why would they start that way as opposed to allowing you have your opinion, come on, train you to shout and to talk and to talk, and to talk back and to think. Why would the army go through this process? I think, look, in fact, when I was there, I didn't understand. Uh, uh, for me, I thought these guys are just crazy. Uh, because again, the military instructors are not very educated. They, 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 you, ju you have just a few, the officers, who only take you now in the academic classes. But the bulk of the military training is not academic. Yeah. So those guys are not very, very well educated. And I really struggled. Why will they do this? Why will they, I'm a whole graduate, why, why will they do this? But now, after having left, now looking back from outside, now I understand the, 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 the import of it. And I think it's about the gravity of what they have to do. It is about the mission that they have to do. Yeah. Because they have to go to war. And you can imagine if you are at war and you are questioning instructions. Yeah. 
um, so, so, so we all have to be aligned. So there's a, a famous saying in the military, kufikiria ni kazi ya commander. It's only the commander who is allowed to think. You just follow. So, so I'll give you a scenario. If you are at war, um, uh, um, uh, and uh, let's say you are advancing, I hope you are, fam you are familiar with the military. So there, there, are three, there are three formations in the, in the military. There's the army, those are the guys who fight on foot. Yeah. Then there's the navy, the ones who fight in water. And then there's the air force that fights on air. Yeah. So, so the bulk of the army is the, is, the, is the army or the foot soldiers. So when you go to war like Kismayo or uh, the issues we've been had in Somalia, the smallest unit of the army is a section. Yeah. So a section has nine people. That's a discipleship group for us. Yeah. So now that nine people, the in charge is called a section commander and is a corporal. So assuming you are advancing and a sniper shoots at you and you can't quite figure where he's shooting from, there are two possibilities. Either you continue advancing and they kill all of you. Or you request one to stand so that he's shot at, so that you can know where the fire is coming from. So you can imagine if you are opinionated, you, you will not stand. So, so because of that import, it is important that you keep your brain at home and follow instructions. So there's a... There's because, a because otherwise the alternative it, is, is your Everyone opinion. will be dead. So, so the military has one of the things, the issue is called um, a kit bag. So a kit bag is one of... It's like a nice basket, but in the military regalia. So one of the instructions when you join is that remove your head, especially the graduates. Keep it in the kit bag. We will tell you when you need it. <laughs> now, it's very interesting because you said something very powerful. You said it looks like it doesn't make sense when you're going through it, but the reason is because there's a greater mission. And the mission is, in the time of war, you can't have nine commanders exactly. in, that, in that section. Exactly. There has to be one voice that everybody is listening. But because the mindset that you walk in is not the same, so the training has to break that down. Exactly. And help you become able to listen to one voice. Exactly. And that section commander is also listening to another voice. Yes. So, so the way the army, so I think uh, the, I'll use that opportunity just to give you a small structure of the army. So you start from the chief of defense forces, who is in charge of the entire army. That's General Kibochi. Then he has three commanders who report to him. So the Army commander, that's kind of General Njeru. The Air Force commander, it's called General um, Omenda. And then there's the Navy commander. I think I've forgotten his name. So, so the armies report to the boss. Then below the armies, there are formations. So formations are like now Moi Air Base in the Air Force, like Kipi Air Base in the Air Force. Then in the Army, you have now formations with like brigades. So like, like the infantry brigade, the armor brigade, the artillery brigade, and stuff like that. So the, 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 the armies are headed by a two-star general. That's a major general. But for the army, because army is big, it's a three-star general, so it's a lieutenant general. Then the formations are headed by brigadiers. Then below the, brig the, brig the formations, there are battalions. So a battalion is like Langata Barracks, yeah. the one on Langata. So it's headed by a lieutenant colonel. Then below the battalion, there's a company headed by a major. Now that, that is the type of people who will lead. Um, so so the, the, the company has like 150 people. Wow. Then below the major, there's a platoon. So a platoon has 39 people, headed by a lieutenant. Then below the platoon, there's a section, section yeah. now headed by, by a corporal, and there are nine people. So all of it feeds up, straight up. Yeah. yeah. And the command given to those three people goes down. It goes all down. To the way, yeah, yeah, all the way down. So, so they, they call their command intent of the commander. So the military calls the, an instruction the intent of the commander. So the intent of the commander is final. Yeah. Whether it's okay or not okay, that's final. Yeah. Mm. You know, it, it, it does make sense, though, because you think about it, and I've said this before, it's better an army that follows a bad command than an army that doesn't follow any command. Exactly. That the one that doesn't follow will die. Yes. You know, you'd actually lose, you'd actually win better with a bad command than exactly. with no command at all. Exactly. And, and so I, think, I think those, just to add on, those examples, I don't want to mention names because we are all East Africans, but you just need to look at the armies of the East African countries and you'll see where there's disorder. All the countries that there's disorder, the disorder starts from the army. Yeah. It never starts from anywhere else. But if you have a united army, like the Kenya army, it's unlikely that you're going to go through a disorder. And I think our elections recently is an example. Yeah. Even in 2008, 
the army stood together. So long as the army stands together, everything is fine. Wow, wow. Things we never think about. That's really powerful. Yeah, let's appreciate that. I mean, it's interesting because you said they take away your hair. <laughs> they take away, I've heard that, I don't know, I don't know how true it is or whether it happens here. They take away your ID. Yes. They take, they take away the things that distinguish and make you an individual. Exactly. And cause you to become a part of something bigger. Yes. And the reason is because they want you not to put your brain away and allow the brain at the top to lead the army. Exactly. So, so just, just to add, the, the ID is taken forever. Oh, it's called So forever. The, the ID is never returned. Wow. So, yeah, no, no, no. When you leave, they give you. But as so long as you're serving in the military, the ID you is property of the states. Yeah. So they give you a military card. And if you go to the bank, you can see they allow national ID and, and military, military cards. Card. So the military card is an official, is an official document. So somewhere after, after six months, just to pick up on where Pastor M is, after six months, they start returning the privileges. Wow. So it mean they break you completely. Even breathing, you, you thank God that you are breathing. Because you feel like they could take away the air. So after six months now, they start returning some of those privileges. So you can now have a warm bath, you can sleep longer. Then you're allowed to go to Nakuru town for like uh, from, um, uh, let's say, 12 o'clock up to 6 o'clock. There you come at 6 or 1. Yeah. Not according to your watch. So you would according to the instructor's watch. <laughs> <laughs> so it, if it is 6, if it is 6. Because now you're in the disciplined force. Yes, you're in the disciplined force. So you, you align then now they return those powers. And because now you're at an equal level, whatever instruction is given, you take it and you learn. Wow. And me, I think sometimes uh, in, in real life, now in, in, in the civilian life, I think the problem is we all start at different levels. But I think there's need sometimes just to start at the same level. Which is what the army does. That is what the army does. It puts everybody at the same Everyone. level. Everyone. And mind you, in most countries, the president's sons join the army. Yeah. Like in Kenya, Philip Moy is a retired military major. Wow. And you know, in the UK, all the royal family well, joins the, the army. army. Yeah. And Biden of uh, the US and all these countries. So, so the, it means that those leaders know something that we don't know. Because they are willing to take their children to the army. Wow. Yeah. We don't think about that. Because they understand the kind of discipline they will need to lead at a certain level. Exactly. Now, let's talk a bit about that, because the army prefers to take ordinary people. You talked about some of these elites, yeah. but I think I remember you saying you could even spot, you came to a place where you could even spot the ones who are too educated or too opinionated, yes. and you could even tell these ones will not succeed. Yes. Why is it that the army likes to take the ordinary person and then turn them into that sophisticated uh, leader or general? Yeah. So, so just when I joined, out of the eight, out of the 70 Kenyans, we were eight graduates. Everyone else was a form four. Wow. And in our graduate group, we would nungunika. Uh, that is French for celebrate. Um, that why would they not just take graduates? Why are they taking form fours? Yeah. But as I grew in the army, I started to appreciate the power of the least qualified person in the crowd. And even in my corporate life, I increasingly prefer the least qualified. And Tell I us think, about that, yeah. yeah I, I think it, it, is, it is how they appreciate the task given. So like if you have a form four uh, 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 cadet who has scored a B, and you have a first class guy in engineering, the form four guy is going to make a better general. Almost certainly. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. I thought you were going to say a, a foot soldier. You're saying a better general. A better general. Does that make sense? He's saying the form four, the, the high school person, is going to make a better general. You know, a general is a guy who commands the whole army. Yes. He's going to make a better general. That yes. one you have to explain. What do you mean by that? I think it's because of how the military is designed. Even, even as you become now functional in the military, so I became a second lieutenant, became a lieutenant, became a captain, then I became a major. Still, you are just supposed to think at your level. So any, anything you do, you still have to check on the intent of the commander. Yeah. So if you're given a task in the military, let's say um, uh, Pastor Milton has been charged for lateness, yeah. and I'm the officer listening to his case, and Pastor M is my boss, I still have to check with Pastor M before I talk to Milton. What is your intent? Wow. Now, here's your report. 
So, so uh, Milton is reporting to me and he has been he's checked. He's not so reporting to me. He's reporting no, he's not to reporting you. to you. He's reporting to me. But you still have to check with yes. your commander before you. Yes. So it's like there's a case in South, uh, the Mavuno South. Yeah. Pastor Angie has to check with Pastor M. There's a gentleman that has been brought to my attention. What do you think? Wow. Then Pastor M will think, I don't know, but we, I, we might be richer without him. That is an instruction to fire. <laughs> So the intent of the commander is an instruction. So you see, a graduate will struggle with that. So, so somebody, the, somebody's struggling with that right now. Any yeah. graduates in the house? Yeah, yeah, yeah you can see so right the, So the more edu I actually struggled. The more educated you are, the more you have your own opinion. Yeah. And you see, those are many armies. Yeah. Those are so many armies. Within the army. Within the army. But we need one army. <laughs> so, so that is why, because the Form 4 guy is happy that look guys i am an air force lieutenant i'm a fighter pilot these guys are taking me for training all over the world this is all i could dream of wow there is no way i'm going yeah because i it's almost like i have no option and just to flip back to 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 jeff hamilton my best guards are class eights wow my best guards uh, uh. Uh, are the uh, class primary, seven dropout, yeah. the class eight guy, primary the form school, one. Yeah. So long as he can speak fluent English and uh, Swahili and write, he will make a better guard than a form four. As, yeah. as controversial as it sounds. Wow. So sometimes too much education is not necessary. From where I sit. Too, too much English is not helpful. <laughs> too much English is not helpful. It's not useful. But now here's a contrary thing because the army takes that person and you talked about how the army puts the best education in that person. Yes. But eventually, they're even more educated than that opinionated exactly. person out there. So, so basically, the army is a training institution. Uh, civilians struggle with what does the army do? You know, that yeah, is a they question. Sit in the barracks the whole yeah, time. That's a question people ask me. If we remove Somali and we remove our soldiers in the peacekeeping mission, what do these guys do? The military is a big university. Wow. As in, they are basically training. Let me, give you an, let me give you an insight. So, most fighter pilots, because of the graduate's age, it's unlikely that a graduate will be a fighter pilot. Because, you see, you join, I was 24. Yeah. But the Form 4 is 18. Yeah. Yeah. So, the Form 4 has more leg room. And uh, the fighter, by the time you are a useful fighter pilot in Kenya, because first you start with the, the Bulldog, then you go to the Tucano, then you go to the Hawk. Those are types of planes. Those are di different planes. Then now you go to the F-5. By the time you are useful that you can now go to war, maybe you are looking at 12, 13 years wow. so, of training. And remember, the flying school has a commandant. It has instructors. Then there are students. So you are a soldier. You are a military officer, but you are a student. Yeah. You are in school for 12 years. Wow. So when someone asks you, what do you do? I'm a student, but I'm a military officer. Yes, and that applies even for the infantry, the foot soldiers. They have a million courses they have to do. Yeah. So that by the time you go to war, you are as good as it comes. And if you look at the National, Milita the National Defense University in Kenya, yes. the, the vice chancellor is a lieutenant general. And a lieutenant general is a three-star general. Kenya has five three-star generals. But one of them is, is heading the university. Wow. So that tells you how, how high. Because the other three star general is the deputy chief of defense forces, and the other one is the army commander. Wow. So you can see the level, and the other one was General Mbadi, who was running Nairobi. So that tells you how high their training is. Yeah. And yeah. each unit has a training school. And those training schools have many instructors. And those instructors are senior officers. So basically, they are You're permanently, they are just permanently training. So you said something, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'll get to where I'm asking this, but you said something about the fact that by the time the army is done and you're at a certain level, you walk different, you talk different, there's a level of sophistication that the army teaches you everything. Yes. That was fascinating for me. The Even army, how you, you eat. Yes. So, so some of the first lessons in the army is toilet use. So how do you enter the toilet? How do you use it? Then how do you walk? So it is unlikely, allow me to demonstrate, it's unlikely that you'll find a military officer walking like this. It, it's unlikely. Yeah. So all of them are straight. There's a way they, there's a way they speak with authority. There's they, a class to teach they, you they, that. They, yes, they, so there's a class to teach. How do you dress? How do you polish your shoes? 
So, so how do you talk to people? So, so you, if, even, even how do you approach a lady if you are a man? So, so there are lessons on if, so it's a lifestyle. So the military is a way of life. Does this sound like discipleship? Yeah. And at the end, they all look a certain way. Yes, so if, 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 you meet a, if I meet a general, I will tell you he's a general. You can just tell from how he's walking. Yes. So like, I'll just give an example. Like Kenyans struggled with General Hussein Ali when he was the, with the police. Yeah. I didn't struggle. In fact, when he was appointed, I knew that will happen. Now, one of the things the military teaches you is pride. Now, military, when I joined the army, I had no self-esteem. But the moment I joined the army, most people, when they tell, you ask them, how is Major Boke? They will tell you it's arrogance. It's, it's not arrogance. It's military pride. Now, the, the military pride, the way the military, the military is so proud, they, they, have, they have no respect for politicians. Wow. So that is why they have to make the president one of them, their own, to be a commander-in-chief. So that they don't see him as a politician. So the military don't see the president as a, as a politician. A they see him as part of their ranks. Wow. Because when you come from the chief of defense forces, from where the military sits, the next rank is the president. So the vice president is not in the military rank. <laughs> and, and, and so is the minister. They, the military, <laughs> in their quietness, they don't recognize. They only recognize the commander in chief. And that is how pride, how proud. So the army is extremely proud. So when General Ali joined the, uh, the, the, the police, because of his military pride, he was going to get into conflict with everyone. Inevitably. And that is how he got into conflict with the DCI, because the DCI made, an ins made a move without talking to him. And for General Ali, that cannot pass. That's Whether you are the son to the president, that will not pass. So you better fire him, but if you work for him, you must respect. Wow. That is how the military works. Yeah. So yeah. the commander is the commander. Regardless, whether he has no brains, <laughs> that is not your part. He is the commander. <laughs> now, I, I wanted you guys to just get a picture, the inside of this thing. And what makes it so efficient? What makes it work? You came out of the military and you went into business. How have you found the things you learned in, mini in military an advantage for you now in civilian life? and as a business, as an entrepreneur. So, so thank you, Pastor. Em. So just before I get that, when I left the military, I was hired by the KICC. Uh, President Kibaki and Tuju had just taken over KICC from Kanu. Yes. So I was appointed the head of security. So in the military, there's a very distinct ranking system. So there's a washroom for officers, there's a washroom for soldiers. And there are different officer messes for different ranks. So in the military, the rank is very, very, important. So I go to the KICC and the washrooms are the same wow. for the managers and everyone else. You're confused. So I was like, no, these guys are not serious. <laughs> so I went to the head of HR to tell them, dude, there's a problem. So I explained to him and he, he, didn't, he laughed and laughed <laughs> and was shocked that what is really my problem. Yeah. So, so I later then started to assimilate the, the, the civilian lifestyle. But just to answer your question, I think one of the things that looking back is one is discipline. You see, discipline is doing what you, doing what is supposed to be done even if you don't feel like it. So Lucy and I train five times a week, even if we don't feel like it. And by train, you mean you going to the gym. Go to the gym so we have a personal trainer out. and every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, whether I am not feeling well. Even during COVID, when I had COVID, I still went for training. Let me ask her. Huh? <laughs> so, how long, when did you leave the military? How many years have you been out? I've been out since 2006. So that is uh, 2006 up to now six, is 17, 17 years. years. Yes. So 17 years later, mm -hmm. your discipline is- Is the same. It's still the so same. I have to shave my head every day. I have to shave my beards. Every day. They, they it has never changed. That's how your mind is. That's how my mind is. When I wake up, up is who you are. I have to spread my bed. So if Lucy, uh, if I leave Lucy on the bed, she'll spread the bed. If she leaves me in the bed, I'll spread the bed. And spread the bed is... is Complete. Is, well done. It's not just with corners nice. Complete. <laughs> it, uh, and then I have to polish my shoes. 
My car is washed daily. So you don't struggle with discipline. That's I don't struggle with it. I don't struggle. Actually, I struggle. One of the things I struggle with is meeting undisciplined people. So I'm happy. I'm happy that Bato, Bato is here. Bato was my executive assistant. And also, I have... Uh, let's appreciate Bato. <laughs> Bato is part of Hill City. So, assuming I give you an interview for a position at Jeff Hamilton, and the interview is at 2 o'clock, and you come at 3 minutes to 2, that is indiscipline. In fact, I will not listen from where I sit. So if you ask Lucy, that interview is lost. Wow. You will not get the job. Wow. So, so you, you have to be disciplined. And I think discipline makes it easy for me in corporate because most guys are very indisciplined. Yeah. So it's so very it's a, easy. It's a competitive advantage. It's very easy to get to the front. I'll give you one of my worst examples of uh, indiscipline in church. Yeah. So Pastor M and I think Pastor Njoro requested me to lead the business chapter at uh, Mavuno Hill City. So me, I go and look for serious speakers because the issue was that we want to speak to SMEs. So whom do I look for? The top HR practitioner in Kenya, that's Paul Kasimu, HR Director Safaricom. I tell them, dude, hey, we have some amazing, you know, the Pastor M and Atuchochanga. We have amazing businessmen in, uh, in uh, Mavuno. These guys are fearless influencers. They are conquering the world. So uh, at 9 o'clock sharp, you arrive, we do the thing. Then at 10, we go all of us to service. Paul tells me, Major, consider it's done. So on that Sunday, I'm here around 7.30. <laughs> so uh, there's yeah. no one. Even the, the, the place you are meeting is not open. Wow. In fact, we need, we need a TV screen. It's not there. Wow. So I summoned my Jeff Hamilton team as backup. In the morning, I heard you talk about backup. <laughs> Get <laughs> so, into action. So I got my team to come. Just, just look like you are Mavuno uh, <laughs> people and take notes. So Kasimu is here at a quarter past eight. Wow. The meeting is at? Nine. Me, I was here at 7.30. He's here at a quarter past eight. We are just the two of us. And I tell God, please, Don't let, let, let these guys come. Wow. This guy is from Mudaiga. Aki itakuwa ip. Do you know, by the time we were doing nine, we were like three. Wow. Now at around 10, 30. Yeah. So we are finished. So we are chatting with Paul. Now people are coming. Is it over? Are you sure? No. Uh, Paul, I have a few questions. Wow. So it just tells you. These are you people who knew they were coming. And they're coming yes. with questions at 9 30. Yes. And these guys are Christians. Not from uh, IPCA? From Mavuno. Mavuno Church. Yeah. Pastor James tells me he has a, an 11 30 service. He doesn't know about the service. Him, his service is at 11. But if you come to his church, you will believe there's an 11 30 service. Because that's when the people show up. Yeah, so he's really talking about something that is a Christian thing, that we somehow just saunter into things of eternal value, very lightly, with no discipline. Yeah. yeah. True that. Have we, has, have, we, have we frozen? You guys are not responding. Yeah. Has, the Zoom, has the Zoom link frozen? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. Yeah, let's keep it real. Yeah. So discipline is one of the areas that it has really... Extremely... Uh, I think the way discipline is... Let me, let me use the word enforced. As in... There is no choice in and, the matter. And, and when the Bible says that the army, the church is an army, the mm -hmm. people of God are an army, mm -hmm. that's one of the things we should that is one of the things. implicitly understand. Yes. It actually calls for discipline. Yes. I'll, I'll give, let me give you an example. So you go to a military bar. Uh, okay, let's call it the officer's mess. So the officer's mess is where lieutenants all the way to generals um, um, hang out. The, everyone came independently. No one invited anyone and you are drinking at your cost. So let's say you are all captains and below. Then a major comes in. Yeah. You all stand and request him for permission to continue drinking. Yeah. Remember you are drunk. <laughs> <laughs> then a colonel comes in. Everyone, including the including major, the major they stand up and they... So the senior most says, Jambo, sir, permission to continue drinking, sir, please. 
then you will say, continue. Uh, assuming you had come with your wife, or your friends, or your girlfriend, you have to stand up and go and introduce your girlfriend or your wife to the senior most officer. So let me explain. So the major came, you introduced. <laughs> then now the colonel has, you introduce again. Then now a senior guy, a brigadier comes, the same drill. Then so by around 10 o'clock, the place is full. You cannot go home until the senior most officer. <laughs> so it goes in the descending order. You have to tarry. So, so, so if it is a general, if the general is drinking up to morning, we are all drinking up to. <laughs> so you just pray. You pray that the senior officer is not a drunkard. Because you are cooked until the and you see the beauty of the, the, the senior officers they are very gen, they are very generous. So when they come, he'll be like, give everyone what is is taking. And you see, he also, he also has a mental um, radar of whiz here. Wow. And then military has people called handlers. So you see, like I came with Sheila. So Sheila is my EA and she's my handler. So so when Pastor M is the general, he has handlers. So let's say I can have Pastor Milton, I can have Pastor Jaymond, you're my handler. So Pastor M might not notice that Major Boke left before the general left. But the two of you have, that is a charge. Wow. That is in discipline. Yani unaona, you think the general is idle. <laughs> you think you are more busy than the you are more busy than the general. Kwani, what are you doing? What is it that is so important? that we have the honor of hosting a general, then you are pretending that you are? Busy. Suspend whatever you are supposed to do and entertain the general. So that is discipline. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so we called it tiring earlier, isn't it? And, and there's, there's precedence for it. But there's something that they're doing because you're saying the general is there and they're benefiting from being with the general. Yes. Yeah, because the general the assumption the, that is there. Exactly, the general is sharing his stories, yeah. his war stories, his experiences, and you all learn from it. Wow. Mm. So I hear you saying one of the things that you think, because I'd asked you that question, what are things, if we as a church feel that we want to be faithful to what Jesus called us to be, which is to be an army, one of the areas that you pointed out and said the church has to understand discipline, yes. because there's no army without discipline. That's yes. one of the areas. Are there other things that we could learn from the army uh, as, as a church? I think so. Outside discipline, I think we could also learn about pride. I, I think Christians are not proud. And, and I think Christians are very apologetic in their faith. Wow. So, so in the marketplace, Muslims are not apologetic. As in they have, like if you go to the shell at Garden Hilton, they, there's, a, there's a mosque where they pray. When uh, you go to um, Ruby's, near where I stay in... Uh, in um, uh, Korompoi, yeah. uh, the, the, it has a mosque. And uh, uh, when you meet them and it's mosque time, they just walk out. They just tell you, dude, we have, we are going forward. For so prayers. they're very proud. And uh, I, uh, most of my clients are Indians. They have their gods. Right there. In the right there. Yeah. And uh, they don't care. It's, it's up to you to deal with it. But, but I think Christians are very apologetic. And uh, even when we introduce, in, in, in what we do. Yeah. So it's not about saying, I'm born again, praise God, yeah, you know, that spiritual thing that Christians do. No, it is, it is, the, it is the action in their Christianity. Yeah. So me, I don't feel it. As in, when, when I meet an Indian, I'll know he's Indian. Yeah. When I meet a Muslim, I'll know he's Muslim. But sometimes when I meet a Christian, I struggle to know that he's a, he's a, he's a Christian. Wow. And, and, and it is even when you do business with a Muslim, it's above board. My Muslim clients, it's above board. As in, they will not ask you for commissions and kickbacks. But Christians will. Yeah. They, they, in fact, almost certainly they will. So, so I think there's something you said in the morning that we, we, we treat Christianity as spiritual. But the army, it is a way of life. Yeah. And that is how Islam is. So you'll find that the army has a way they wed, they have their hostels, they have, they have the way they bury, there's a military way to do everything. Wow. So, so one of them is uh, pride, then the other one is leadership. I think if you ask me one thing that is a fundamental problem with the church today is, is leadership. And uh, it's not like we don't have good leaders, but we don't affirm our leaders. 
And, uh, and um, uh, uh, the best example I use is that I'm married to Lucy, but for me to lead her, she must agree that I lead her. That's true. She must affirm me as the leader. If she does not, then I'm not a leader. Yeah. Then we are both leaders. And I think that is the problem in the church today. So everyone seems to have their vision. They don't seem to be aligned with the vision of the leader. In the military, <laughs> I don't know what I can say. The commander's that he, intent. In fact, there is no room. The commander's intent, and even when, I'll give you an example so that I, I don't take a lot of time. So let's say there's a baraza, like a staff meeting. So the military calls it a baraza. Then a senior officer is the one addressing. And he says, uh, so he speaks, he speaks, he speaks. Then now assuming it is Pastor M is the senior commander. Then he tells Pastor Kevo or Pastor Angie, do you have anything to add? So you'll find that maybe in our civilian setting, that person comes with their own dimension. And they take and a complete tangent and you're like, eh? We're in a well, no, meeting. these are different someone. <laughs> in the army, you, one, you can't talk for long. That is indiscipline. So, because it is not your parade. It is not your, it is the commander's parade. And every sentence you say, you must say, Vile commander alisema. The way the commander said, like, let's say you say 20 words. Vile, the way the commander said will be like 13 words. <laughs> As in you are basically reinforcing the message. what the commander said. The commander said we need to keep time. I hope we understand that it is important to For keep time. time. You know, we must honor our commander. And the commander cannot t take his time to come and tell us and we are not listening. I don't think that is fair to the commander. Vile commander amesema. <laughs> so that is, so, so you, you just align to what the commander is saying. And wow. I think that I, I heard Pastor M say that. It does not belittle you. I think for me, yeah. now that I'm in a leadership role, I think it actually makes you a better leader. You can't lead if you are not led. And I think that is the military principle, that we must celebrate our leaders. Yeah. My experience, when I was leading an um, Andorra group, or a Mizizi group, yeah. I had some lady share in the morning that this, this day she was expecting people Nobody and no one came. Yeah. I think that is very normal yeah. in, 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 in our uh, life, especially as Christians. It, it, it is unlikely that the, the, disciple, the discipleship group will start meeting at three and people will be there at three. Yeah. In fact, I can, I can put my life on it <laughs> that the first guy will be there at five. <laughs> the first guy. And he will be like, hey, what are Kuji? <laughs> so, so that is the fashion. I thought I, thought I, I was late. I so I was next late. time I'll come late actually. to add another, another wow one. are you guys is this is this uh, is this helpful yeah i mean guys the military is a culture within the culture and that's the only way they can succeed by creating a culture within the culture and i feel like what major boke is challenging us to do is to say if you want to learn you have to be willing to create a culture within a culture it means you can't be indisciplined everybody else around you is indisciplined how do you stand out there has to be a difference. And one of the ways is, hey, I show up. I'm on time. I do what I'm supposed to do. I keep my word. I don't show up any time I want to. When we agree to show up at this time, I show up at that time. That's what it means to be in the military. That's what Jesus says when he wants us to be an army. Uh, it also means that we honor our leaders. We, we celebrate them because we understand I am because they are. And basically, God has poured in the church. We say God, here they say the state has given authority to them. We say God has given them authority on my behalf. And so if I don't honor my leader, I don't support what they're saying, I come up with my own agendas that take the group this way, and our leader is taking the group this way, then we flounder. We never get to where we're going. I think they're very practical lessons that you're giving us that Thank would you. really help us as a church. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Maybe just a final... Something else you just say. I mean, you've been, a, you've been in the army, you've been in the church. You've been in both. And I think I, I've always been fascinated to ask you these questions. Like, yeah, what would you say? I know been, it probably was frustrating for you yeah. joining the church that calls itself an army and then finding, oh my goodness, maybe we don't live to what we say we are. So anyway, maybe just 
Anything encouraging? Maybe leave us with something encouraging. We might get disca- too discouraged after yeah. this. <laughs> the, let me look for something encouraging. <laughs> 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 I think what, what, I, what, what I would say, I think for me what I would say, now that I lead a big organization, is uh, the, the power to basically affirm our leadership. Because leadership is very lonely and it is very difficult. Um, and I liked what Pastor M was saying that he felt good when someone goes to a, a forum and you say, my pastor said this. Because when you do that, then you basically speak life into leadership. Wow. So, so I would encourage us to basically make it easy for us to be led. I think Christians, we make it very hard to be led. So, so that would be my encouragement. But that said and done, I think uh, Mavuno is a great movement. And um, I know we are uh, doing a lot of things. I just heard we are doing Legos. And uh, also Mavunites are very good people, especially in corporate. Allow me to say that. That uh, part of our growth as, as Jeff Hamilton has been hinged on the Mavunites who are in the corporate place. And there's something, and I'm not telling you this so that you feel nice. There's something about Mavunites that is uniquely different with a typical uh, Christian. So for me, if you, I think the Mavunites are very practical. They are not very theological. And uh, especially for me, I've benefited uh, because of the goodwill of Mavunites, which I think is a good thing. Because then we need to get to a point where we trust each other yeah. as Mavunites. And every time I do Kigali, every time I do um, um, uh, Kampala, it is the, it's the first place I stop is Mavuno, which I think is a marketplace evangelism. And so long as we can do that, then I think we'll become a very powerful movement. So that is what I would say. Wow. Thank you so much, Major Boke. This has been a privilege and an honor to have you. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Keep teaching us. Thank Keep you. teaching us. Thank you. Wow, let's appreciate Major Boke. We're so grateful to have him as one of our people. Uh, thank you so much. Maybe we can just sit for a bit just to, uh, I want us to just take a few minutes to sort of debrief on what we've had. Maybe I'll just share a couple of scriptures because I think we need to anchor whatever we learn in scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 3. It says, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Maybe you are listening to Major Boke and saying, aye, that's a military. Those are, that's a very secular. That's not in the Bible. But what does the Bible say? It says that that person, their preoccupation is the commander's intent. The commander's intent. We know that for us, the commander is Jesus. But just like the military, when you're a soldier, you don't have access your, you, you, Jesus gives commanders. In his army, he has commanders. And he will give those commanders access. And there's an intent. And when your commander says, this is what our compass is doing, we're showing up for prayer this time, that's Jesus' intent. It's as good as Jesus' intent. Yeah, and you will thrive in it. I remember when we started the 430 prayers, and I said, Mavuno, we pray at 430. Now, I mean, there are many people who said, why 4.30 in the morning? That is, that's ridiculous. I mean, people, are you saying Jesus can't hear me at midnight? <laughs> and I, that's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that at Mavuno, we pray at 4.30. And you know, it's very interesting. As you have aligned, have you not benefited? Yeah, you have grown. We've grown. There's been a power when the movement is united, praying in one accord. I remember that I said this, I think I might have said this earlier, but I remember when we started doing the joint prayers, I think it was, was it last week or last week but one, when we restarted our prayers after Jan 9th, when we restarted our prayers, and we had that week of prayer. And I just remember the chill of seeing almost a thousand gadgets and people praying early in the morning together. If as one people speaking the same language, they began to do this, nothing is impossible. Guess what? We were all praying before that. Are you saying that, okay, we were praying, even though maybe not for an hour, we were all praying, people. But how come there's power now? It's because we are all in one accord. Yeah, and this is what, these armies do that. Civilians don't do that. They are preoccupied with their own intent. 
But the army says no one as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 12. Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 12. It says, finally, be strong in, in the Lord. Can you put up those verses as I share them? Uh, the person who was doing such a good job earlier. Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 12. Is it up? Not yet. Okay. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And then verse 10, 11. Just keep going. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's evil schemes. And then verse 12, the last one. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. One of the things that makes people get uncomfortable when we talk about army is because we always say, but we, are, we, are, we, are people, we, are, we love other people. For us, the picture of an army is a violent thing. It's something that takes lives. We're not supposed to be that. But Paul says, no, 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 I'm not talking about a physical, it's not a physical fight we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that there is an army arrayed against us in the spiritual realms, which is why people are dying of alcoholism in our country. It's why corruption is choking this continent. It's why uh, uh, people, families are breaking down all around us because there's an evil army that is destroying the family. And what does Paul say to, the, uh, to, the, to, to God's people? Put on the full armor. Civilians don't wear armor. Civilians don't wear armor. If you're a member of God's house, you're supposed to be a soldier. Only soldiers put on armor. And he says, because there's a struggle that we're in. And you heard from Major Boke saying, the reason that soldiers go through training is because there's a struggle. And when the struggle comes, they can't be listening to nine voices. When you're in, the, you're in, in your discipleship group, and there's a spiritual attack against one of you, you can't all be saying what we are going to do. There has to be one person who says, let's do this. And everybody says, we are doing it. And you know the thing about it is, when we speak together, nothing is impossible. Even if the command, and I say this, I'm Pastor M, I'm not infallible. Maybe six o'clock would have been a better time to pray. Maybe more people would have joined. Maybe it would have been better for global harmony and peace in the movement because of time zones and all those things. Maybe there are other strategic considerations. And if you are the leader, you'd have picked a better time. No doubt. But you know what? A bad command is better than 500 good commands. Yeah. yeah. You never win with 500 good commands. We would all be dead. But guess what? The gates of hell are not prevailing against us right now. There are miracles everywhere in Mabuno Church. Yeah. Yeah, they're happening. And you guys are the, your witness to that. And it's because we are all together in one accord, following one voice, one command. This is the time we pray. So it says, listen, there's struggle. Guys, you're not civ don't walk around like a civilian in a battlefield. Because there's a battlefield around us. And you're walking around in your marriage not understanding this, I'm in a battlefield. <laughs> Some of you know it, but uh, that's a different story. Uh, your, your marriage is under attack. Yeah. There's an enemy that doesn't want it to end well. Your children are under attack. You cannot be civilians. You can't be sleeping and you have children. Somebody has to wake up at 4.30 to pray for those children. And if not you, then who? The children's pastor has their own children and their own problems. So if you're thinking they're the ones representing you, come on, somebody. You have to, you have to be trained. You have to be ready. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 to 19. Matthew 16, 18 to 19, if you could turn there. This is Jesus speaking. And he says some very powerful words to his disciples and to one of them in particular. And he says, and I tell you, come on, let's read that together. You, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Verse 19, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Sometimes people translate this and they think Jesus was saying Peter should be the Pope 
and he's the one who loses everything. But actually, no. The, the church that is being given, is that against whom the, the gates of hell will not prevail, is the one that's being given the keys. And the church is not you, it is us. Pastor M is not the church. You heard Major Boke say, a general is not a general if he has no soldiers following him. <laughs> yeah, he, he might be the most gifted general there ever was, but if you have no army, you're nothing. It's only when we come together that we have this key. And he says, I've given you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Can we read that part again? Because I want us to understand what happens at 4.30 when we are all praying together as a church with the keys. What does it say? Whatever, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Guys, there are things that are going to be loosed this year because we are praying together. Yeah. There are things that are going to be loosed tomorrow and on Saturday as we pray together. And there are things that are going to be bound simply because we're in agreement as God's people. But here's the, the thing. You need to understand, Jesus was using very military terms to describe his church. He says, the gates of hell, I will build my church and the gates of hell would not overcome it. You know, gates are the defensive structures of a city. Whenever an army went against a city, the place it attacked, because the city is built of fortified walls. If you've ever been to one of those cities, any of you, I don't know if you've ever been to those cities. If you go to places like Jerusalem, which my wife and I have had the opportunity to go to, the wall of that city is like from here, and it goes till the back of the tent hukko. It's like many, 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 many feet across. It's like houses inside the wall. So for you to do a frontal assault on the wall with the weapons of those days, it was almost impossible because it was fortified. So the place that you went to was the gate. And you assaulted the gate. Many people hear when it says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And they think what that means is that devil will not be able to attack us. You don't understand. That is not a defensive metaphor. It is an offensive metaphor. In other words, when the church is united, the gates of hell cannot withstand us. We push down those gates of hell. And all those alcoholic brothers and sisters, we pull them out in Jesus' name. All that corruption in our nation, we pull it down in Jesus' name. Because we have the keys. Tell your neighbor you have the keys. Yeah. But you have it only as we have it together. Because we're an army. And that's a very military thing. Because only armies knock down gates. Yeah, the church is an army. Yes, we're a family, but we're an army. Because we're supposed to take down the gates of hell. And so I want to just say this, that as we've talked to the Mijaboki, I'm hoping that something is connecting for us. That God is not calling us to this complacent Christianity where we're just happy-go-lucky, nice people. We show up in church when we feel like. We go to DG when it's convenient. He's calling us to a very different kind of Christianity. It's a Christianity that understands that there's a leader and that we are soldiers. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. By the way, do you, not, do you understand that's what happens when you give your, milit your ID away? ID. In Kenya, that's a big thing. Every place you go, that's what you show. It's what you use for your impressor. It's what determines who you are. It's like it's your identity. We even call it your identity card. And what happens when you go to the military? I no longer live. Now, the military is what I live for. As a Christian, I handed in my ID the minute I gave my life to Jesus. Now I belong to Jesus. Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. I follow the intent of the commander. That's what I was created for. Now, I told you we're going to go deeper because I believe God is calling us away from civilian Christianity into a military Christianity. He's calling us to become an army. And this whole year, that's what we're going to become, we're, we're entering into is to what does a boot camp look like? What does it look like for us to learn to follow? What does it look like for us to be able to be in the commander's intent, to be able to understand our leader's intent? What does it look like for us to be able to command as well, to learn to be proud about the thing we have? and to represent it well, to learn not to be afraid as Christians, but to understand that wherever I am put, I'm here representing the intent of the government that put me here. Come on, somebody. I, I, I know people who work in some of the embassies of this country, and you meet that guy, and you look at him, and he tells you, I'm a farmer, or I'm a, I'm a trade guy, I'm just looking for business. You look at him, and you know this guy is a spy. Even the way he stands, he's not standing like a farmer. He's not standing like a business attache. I, am I talking to somebody? There's some of these guys you look at and you just know, this one's an assassin. He's just here representing some government. And he's saying, I'm just learning a bit about how Kenyans are, are doing business. But he's on an agenda. That guy is on one agenda only, which is the affairs of the nation that sent him. And if it means that he's here to destabilize the country of Kenya, so be it. 
Because he's here with one agenda. It's not to be nice. It's, he's here to represent what his commanding officer has told him to come and do. Guess what? As Christians, we are not citizens of this world. That's what the scripture says. We represent a foreign government. We are ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven. And if it means when I enter my workplace that my agenda is subversive to the corrupt agenda of the boss I'm working for, so be it. Because I'm not here to work for the boss. I'm here to work for the one who sent me to be in that place as an ambassador. And I'm here representing the, the, the agenda of the kingdom of heaven. The agenda of the kingdom of heaven. That's what I'm here for. Unfortunately, many Christians walk through life as civilians, unaware of the cosmic struggle that is going on around them. And so today I want God to just help us. Ah, this is what I'm praying for us. God help us. Open our eyes this week to begin to understand that we are called to be a different people. We're called to be a people who think differently, who act differently, who show up differently. This is going to be a year when you learn discipline. You know, I, 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 one of the things I've been noticing when I come for the 430 prayers, if you come in at 430 prayer, you're going to find your campus pastor is on. Yeah? With his video on. And he's usually up 10 minutes to time because he understands that past, according to Pastor M, 10 minutes to time is when, yeah, that's on time. And he's on with his, with his video. And his, camp, his staff members are there. His, 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 his family is there with their videos on. I'm Ajay Wamboy. Yeah, yeah, they're there. They're there. And then there's a whole lot of other people who show up at like 4.30. That's when they're entering. You can even see audio. What does it say? Trying to connect audio. Huh? Co connecting audio. And it's 4.30 already. You're already late. You're already late because you, you, you're not there. You're not there on time. And then at 4, 4.45, you start to see now the people coming in. Like they have stumbled out, out of... Uh, 5 o'clock, in fact, that's when the numbers now expand dramatically. They came for 5 o'clock prayers. We don't have 5 o'clock prayers in Mavuno Church. It's 4.30. It's 4.30. So one of the things I'd love to see going forward, guys, is that the people in this room will represent the army in Mavuno Church. It doesn't matter if everybody else shows up at 5.30 or at 5.25. You guys will be there with your... With, you have the intent of your commander. Your campus pastor was there at 4.20. When we say 4.30 prayers, for the army, it's 4.20 prayers. And actually, one of the things I'm praying that will happen this year, this year is that we're even going to learn to wake up before that so that we can have prayed up for ourselves so that when you go into the meeting, you're praying for your people who are following you. But do, by the way, you know that's what I do. Whenever I show up for your prayer meeting, I'm not there to pray for myself. When Pastor Jemo says, okay, now let's, let's intercede. Let's confess. I never confess for myself. I did that before, long before. When I enter your prayer meeting, I confess for your sins. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. I'm like, Lord, I confess the sins of this congregation. I confess the sins of their children. Father, have mercy on them. Because the Bible tells us that Job used to confess the sins of his children. He would do an altar. He would do a sacrifice for them. So I'm there to pray for you. Why? Because I've already prayed for myself. And even for my children. Before I came into your meeting. That's what soldiers do. Yeah, because if you don't do, when, when are you going to get time to pray for your discipleship group? And yet you're the person who's their discipler. So I think God is calling us to a new level. Tell your neighbor, next level. Next level. God is going to teach us to stop being civilians and become soldiers in God's army. And become a disciplined force that now can actually say we are impacting society for Jesus. Ah, laziness is defeated in Jesus' name. Yeah, Major Boke, it's been exercised. Thank you. Laziness is no longer our thing in this church. Coming up whenever we show up. Pastor James said we show up at 9 and we showed up at 9.30 to ask whether the meeting happened. That's no longer in our vocabulary in this room in Jesus' name. And you know what? We talked about command. I want to tell you as a discipleship leader, it is your job to command your people. You've been late the last three weeks. What is going on? Are you serious about this discipleship? I love you, but this is not going to help you grow. Yeah, this... You're, what are you training? The, how are you going to train the people you disciple if you're mediocre in your timekeeping? We need to teach our people. That's what, by the way, I talk to my kids that way. Why do I talk to them that way? Because I love them too much to leave them mediocre. Yeah. When you think you're loving that you don't rebuke somebody or you don't challenge somebody because you love them too much, actually you don't love them. You love yourself. Yeah. If you truly love them, you'd love them too much to leave them mediocre. So be able to challenge people and do it in a loving way, but challenge them anyway. Because you're like, guys, I don't want to leave anyone behind. We are called to be an army. This is who God wants us to be. Somebody say, I'm understanding. Yeah, come on, let's stand up to our feet right now. 
I want us to just take a moment to pray. Our time is gone. I want us to end in a few minutes. But I think we need to just pray a bit. And, and before we pray, as we're standing, I want you to just tell the person next to you one thing that you had today that you want to action. What is one thing that you've just learned from Major Boke from this conversation that you're like, I want to do something different. I'm making a commitment about this that's going to be different. Just one thing. How are you going to apply this word in your personal life? Just one thing. What do you sense God could be saying to you in that conversation? the other person also tells you what they're thinking what's one thing you'd like to change at home in your job maybe at work in the way you show up at church just something you feel you'd like to make different asking the Spirit to change us, to mold us, to make us who He wants us to be. That's what we are asking right now. So even as you've shared, I want you to just say a prayer for yourself right now. You can just lift up your voice for just one minute and just pray that God would shape you, change you, that this word would not be lost on you, that you will be good soil. Just pray that you would be good soil, that this would not just be a good inspiring message you've heard, but something is going to shift going forward in your life. Just pray for yourself. Put your hand on your head if you need to. And just say, Lord, I'm praying for myself right now. Uh, help me not to be mediocre. Help me to show up as I should. Teach me. This is a year of learning. Lord, I want to learn. I don't want my inhibitions, my natural inclinations, my natural laziness, my natural opinionatedness to stop me from anything you have for me. Just ask God to speak to you right now, to show you what He has for you, to help you become the Christian, the person, the follower, the disciple that He wants you to be. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Listen to the prayers of your children. As we pray, Lord, make this different. Give us an ability to understand. Open our minds. Open our minds. Open our minds. Thank you, Lord. Just put your hand on your head right now. Father, I want to pray for your children. That, Lord, you would open our minds and give us understanding. That, Lord Jesus, these things we listen to will not just be ideas but that, Lord, they would transform us. I thank you for the grace that you've taught us to be a family. You're teaching us about how amazing it is to be a family. But, Lord, you don't just want us to be a cozy family. You want us to be a family on a mission, understanding that this family that loves each other is meant to change the world as well. And we cannot change the world the way we are constituted unless something changes. And so I pray for us, Lord. Change us. Lord, as we put our hands on our heads right now, change us change our thinking give us a different way of understanding Lord help us not to be people who are just casual bystanders in this journey in life but cause us to be people who understand the master's intent and as a result Lord we will be dangerous to the gates of hell that Father God the gates of hell would not stand against our families they will not stand against the people we love they will not stand against our culture and our businesses that because we are the people who know you, we will be strong and do exploits. And so, Lord, I thank you for the word you've given us today. I thank you that you're taking us deeper and you're teaching us more and more, helping us to know you more and more, helping us to love you more and more. And I just pray that, Lord, you just open up our eyes, open up our hearts, open up our minds to comprehend everything you have for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I don't know if somebody has been feeling a bit unwell over this time. I just sense that I should pray for uh, somebody who's unwell right now in this house. There's just somebody who's unwell. Just stretch your hand up, put it up. You, you, you've been struggling with some ailment while you're here. Yeah, Lord, I thank you because you're a healer. And Lord, I thank you because the centurion said, I'm a man under authority. And I say to this one, go, and that one, go. 
And right now, Lord, I, under, I stand here as a man under authority, the authority of the kingdom of heaven. I stand here as one who has the authority of Jesus Christ himself. And I speak against every ailment that is plaguing your sons and daughters in this house right now in Jesus' name. I say, be gone. Be gone right now in Jesus' name. Any spirit of infirmity, you're banished from this place. You're banished from distracting this child of God right now in Jesus' name. And I speak over you the healing of God. <laughs> I speak the dispelling of all evil spirits, anything that would be harming you, even things that are not evil spirit, they're, they're, they're physio physiological or psychological. I speak them over you right now, that they're no longer a distraction in your life in Jesus' name. And that you will have full attention in this place and plagued by whatever condition that was. It is no longer yours in Jesus' name. And so, Father, I thank you for these whose hands are up. And I pray that tomorrow we will have testimonies that our God is a healer. I thank you, Lord, because you do it. You do it, Lord. And Lord, I speak now as your servant and I say that your children are blessed. Our evenings are blessed. You will sleep well. You will be rested. You will wake up fresh and ready tomorrow to receive all the impartation that the Father has for you. And so I bless you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And God's people say together. Amen. Somebody give glory to Jesus. Woo! Amen. Amen. So tomorrow we're here, 6 o'clock. The army of God is awake and, are, and alive. Don't come in at 6, come in at least 10 to. Let's just storm this place. It's going to be a time of miracles. We're going to pray for signs and wonders tomorrow as we pray for healing and other things among us. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. See you bright and early in the morning. Amen. God bless.